everyone, it's Vanessa. I wanted to wrap up the last few things that I got to in February. So I have four things to talk about in this video, and I shall start with Sweet Tooth Volume 4. I thought this volume was definitely back on track when it comes to telling character stories, because that's what I most like about it from Volume 1 and 2, and kind of lacked in Volume 3. From the start of the series, for me, the heart of the story is definitely Gus and Jeopard, so seeing more of them in Volume 4 was definitely what I wanted. I thought Lemire did some really interesting things with the medium here as well, when the characters were telling their own backstories, the art style would completely change to kind of match the character's personality. I like seeing how the characters saw themselves kind of reflected in the way that the art was done. There's also one entire issue, I believe it was the first issue, that is completely sideways. So that was a completely new experience for me reading a graphic novel, having to read it horizontally instead of vertically like you normally read a graphic novel or a book. One thing that I have really enjoyed throughout this entire series is its focus on religion and prophecy. In Volume 4, we are focusing even more in on that as we continue to try to figure out what ended up causing this plague and kind of where the story is going to end up. I got two more volumes to go and I'm definitely excited to finish up this series. The next thing that I'll talk about is The Miserable Mill, which is the fourth book in the series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. This one I didn't rate as highly as I did the first three and I think it's kind of hitting that point of it being slightly repetitive now and I also did not really care for the Guardian in this one and one thing that had me engrossed in the last book was definitely the Guardian and even in book two the Guardian was really interesting as well but I thought that the Guardian in book four didn't really provide that much like humor to the story so while it still had its funny moments I thought the story wasn't as engaging I will say I do truly love how much this series focuses on libraries and the power of reading and the power of books Books, and I love seeing that depicted in this series. So I'm now ready to finish watching those last two episodes. I'm just waiting for my boyfriend to catch up on this book so we can watch those last two episodes and then I can move on to book five. The next thing that I finished was Gabby, A Girl in Pieces by Isabel Quintero and this focuses on Gabby as she is finishing her senior year of high school in California. She is growing up with her mom, her brother, and then there's also her father who's kind of there but sometimes he's absent because he is addicted to drugs just in the first few pages you find out her best friend has just learned that she is pregnant and also she has a gay best friend that's a male that is just coming out to his family. This is focusing on Latinx characters and it's from a Latinx author which is something that I really wanted to focus on this year. It's all told in diary entries so the way that it's told is very approachable. It literally feels like she's just talking to you. I listened to part of this on audiobook and I would recommend the audiobook again because it is just somebody reading to you their diary. I love these characters and I thought that Isabel Quintero did a really good job at making them three-dimensional even though they are only coming from Gabby's perspective through her diary. I love the main messages in this that were being sent out to us were basically positive feminist messages. Gabby could have easily wallowed, but instead she kind of faced it full force. She was critical of her place in the world and fought back to that world with logic, which I found really amazing coming from a 17-year-old character. Many of her thoughts really reminded me of myself when I was her age. I don't really know if this is because my parents are also Latinos. It might just be a lot of parents are like this, but some things that were told here were little bits of family dynamic that I don't really see portrayed often in books that reflected my own lived experience. For example, code switching and talking in Spanglish was something that was very relevant to my life, so I really enjoyed how Isabel Quintero did the Spanglish back and forth, and I thought that she did it in a way that didn't feel like I'm just putting Spanish words in here just because I want to let you know that I am Latina as a character, which is something that I've seen in other books that have Latinx characters. So I I did like that aspect of it, definitely. Other little tidbits that I wanted to mention, which you can see I made little notes to go back to read to you guys. She has a big thing about like eating behind her mom's back in her room and she is a fat character and her mom is kind of telling her like, it's por tu bien, like it's for your own good, you know? The way that she says like, it's for your own good, like es por tu bien is something that happened to me growing up and I didn't at all feel like Gabby felt about her weight but it's definitely something that I feel like a lot of uh, Latina moms and stepmoms and like motherly figures in your life kind of pick at you whenever I would 
look like I had lost some weight. Everybody would always come and, you know, like, estas flaca, estas flaquita. And it's something that kind of gets at your brain and you start thinking like, oh, I have to be this specific way. I remember I would go on like crash diets. I would tell myself I can't eat any junk food at all. I mean, it's been probably almost a decade since this, but I remember my stepmom telling me that I needed to exercise. And that's something that Gabby's mom also tells her in this book, like, go exercise. My stepmom wouldn't be like, oh, we should go walk together to both better our health. It's more like you need to exercise because of the way you look and I don't want you to look that way. So my stepmom would tell me like, oh, just go run up and down the stairs of our house. I mean, I ended up doing that. <laughs> I did go run up and down the stairs because she told me to. But like looking back at it, that's not the way you get a teenage girl to try to exercise to better her own health. Those are just experiences that I feel like she portrayed really vividly and realistically here. Another little example, when they were doing Thanksgiving and Christmas, Gabby says, Cindy and Sebastian came over so we could all exchange gifts. We have to wait until the 26th since we can't see each other on Christmas because Christmas is family time at all our houses. That totally is the case for me as well. Growing up, I never saw my friends on the 25th. I never saw my friends on Thanksgiving, even after we were done doing dinner and doing the opening of gifts or whatever. It was always like that whole entire day is for family time. You can't really go see your friends. So I thought that was a really interesting tidbit to see in here as well. The only reason why I didn't rate it as highly as I really thought I was going to before I started it is that I found it to be a little bit more issues focused than it was like themes and symbols focused. Kind of wanted it to compare to The Absolutely True Diary of Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi and that one is definitely very themes heavy and symbols heavy and it definitely deals with issues but I think it's more about the themes than it is about the issues and here it kind of felt like a lot of issues were happening like teenage pregnancy, drug addiction, racism, trying to come out of that and find some mobility, a son coming out to a very strict Catholic family, rape. The rape one specifically I thought went weird towards the end. It was hidden throughout the entire novel and kind of just popped up at the end. I don't really know if I liked how it was resolved more of an issue focused book than it is a themes book and I sort of wished it had been just a little bit more themes heavy. All in all, I do recommend this book, especially because of the representation in it and seeing parts of my life reflected in this book. Even though I'm not Mexican American, I could still see some of Latin American uh, in here that I've experienced myself. And last but not least, I read No Crystal Stare by Vonda Michu Nelson. And this is about Louis Michu, who was a bookseller in Harlem. He started his own store called the National Memorial African Bookstore, and it focused on black literature, like exclusively. He started in 1939 when it was kind of unheard of for this to be a thing. He also came across a lot of like ambivalence towards starting that kind of project, both from his family and from people that he was trying to get to loan him money to start the store. He did it anyway and it became a really successful bookstore. True life actually happened. This takes on some of that true life experience and also puts in some novelization to it as well from oral history. All of it is told in entries as you can see from different characters in Louis Michoud's life. And there are also clippings from books and FBI files and newspapers throughout too. I thought that this seemed like a really interesting different kind of concept for a history like this with it having some fictional aspects to it. And I did find that learning about this man was incredibly important especially because his ideas on his own race and their history was kind of different than the mainstream. He was very good friends with Malcolm X and they kind of impacted each other. What I found interesting about him not really fitting the mainstream was that while he looked up to MLK, he didn't necessarily agree with his messages and just in general about educated people and educated black people not necessarily understanding the plight of the normal black man as Louis Michou saw it. He had a lot of good lines throughout here. He'd say things like, I read up on all the gods and all religions and I found out who the real lord is. That is the landlord. This one too is from the character of Snooze. He comes in and he does the closed fist salute. Lewis asks, what's that? And Snooze replies, black power. And after Snooze opens his hands, Lewis says, see, you ain't got nothing in it. He picks up a book, puts it in my hand and says, now that's power. Tell your brothers in the movement that black is beautiful, but knowledge is power. So he definitely was a proponent of 
reading and reading and education being a way to open up doors. The only real issues I had with this book is that because of the way that it was put together with the entries that were like diary entries from first person characters in Lewis's life, I felt like sometimes there was never really a good flow to it. I couldn't also really differentiate a lot of these characters, so I never really felt like I could get into the mind of each specific character. And it did feel a little bit awkward at times, especially the characters that the author made up from oral histories to kind of complete the story. Some of them felt a little bit forced. So I kind of wish at the end of it that it had been just documentary and no real novel to it. Like the reasons why the author did that was because she didn't have enough material to work with to make it only nonfiction. So I understand where she's coming from, I just don't know if the storytelling aspect of it really worked all the way for me. But definitely what I learned from this, understanding who this man was, was definitely worth it for me. So I would recommend it just to learn more about the person, but there are also other things you can find online about the person and I'll leave some of those below too if you just want to read up on who this man was and kind of his main basic philosophies of life. I hope you enjoyed hearing my thoughts on it. If you read any of these or are interested in any of these let me know down below and I will see you in my next video. Bye bye!